All right, y'all, let's talk about the updates coming out of Gaza here. So this was a, a big deal. So this happened the other day. 24 IDF soldiers killed on deadliest day for Israeli forces in Gaza combat. So let me go through a little bit of the CNN piece, then I'll tell you uh, what actually went down on the ground here, because, of course, they put their slight little spin on it. 24 Israeli soldiers were killed during fighting in Gaza on Monday, the military said. Notice how they're just, like, quoting the IDF here, or paraphrasing the IDF giving their version of the story. In the deadliest day for its troops inside the battered enclave since the war with Hamas began, most of the, the soldiers, 21, were killed in an attack in central Gaza when a terrorist squad surprised our fighters and launched missiles and rockets, said Daniel Hagari, spokesperson for the Israeli Defense Forces. That attack, which Hagari said happened several, out, several hundred meters from the eastern border, was the deadliest single incident for the IDF in Gaza since the ground invasion began on October 27th. A further three Israeli soldiers, an IDF captain and two majors, were killed in a separate incident the same day in southern Gaza. The attack in central Gaza took place as the IDF soldiers were laying explosives to demolish, quote, terror infrastructure buildings, according to Hagari. More on that in a second. A rocket-propelled grenade hit one of the buildings and set off an explosion that led to its collapse. So the RPG triggered the other explosives in the building that they were setting up, and that led to its, its collapse. Quote, Most of our fighters died because of the collapse of the building, Hagari said. Another RPG hit a nearby IDF tank, killing the commander and another Israeli soldier. On Monday, the Hamas-controlled health ministry in Gaza said the number of Palestinians killed in Israeli attacks in Gaza since October 7th has risen to 25,295 with at least 63,000 injuries recorded. Now, by the way, let me again just point out real quick, even these numbers coming from the Gaza Health Ministry undercount because it, they don't include the people who have been trapped under the rubble for a very extended period of time. That's why I like to use the Euromed Monitor numbers, the Human Rights Group, because they include in their tally people who've been caught under the rubble for an extended period of time who are almost certainly dead. So if you go based off those numbers, it's about 32,000, maybe 33,000 that have died. It's not 25,000. Okay, so now the reality of the situation is this. Um, they say we were going after terror infrastructure and buildings. It was literally just houses. They were rigging explosives to houses, and there was a counterattack from Hamas militants, and it ended up killing them. So again, deadliest day yet for the IDF. Now, is that actually true? I'm not 100% sure if that's exactly true because there have been a number of videos that are coming out. I mean, you guys have probably seen this. Hamas is literally releasing videos with a little red arrow over the top of uh, the IDF when they take out a tank, and they've taken out a number of tanks. So my guess is the IDF is actually sort of um, hiding the true impact of, of what's happening here. I think there's... Because they lied early on about the numbers. You remember that story? They said, oh yeah, it's this amount, and then what happened was journalists went and checked like all the different hospitals and the number far surpassed, the number of people being admitted far surpassed what the IDF said was happening. So I think they're sort of downplaying a little bit um, as a general rule of thumb, the impact on the IDF. So I think it actually is a little more devastating for them than they're letting on. But that being said, this story right here apparently is one that's undeniable and made headlines. So now let me show you this. I'm going to give you a warning up front Warning up front, this is going to be a guy waving a white flag. He talks to some reporters, and then after the interview, you'll see they snipe this guy dead. Hands up, waving a white flag, and then you need to ask yourself, this is now the what? Third, fourth time we've seen something like this literally on camera? Those are just the recorded ones. How many times has this happened not on camera, not recorded? This is a very, very regular occurrence in Gaza. All right, let's watch. As he moved forwards towards the combat zone, he noticed this group of men doing their utmost to appear non-threatening, trying to proceed with care. They wanted to reach two other family members and get them out of harm's way. <laughs> The interview complete, our cameraman walked away. And then this happened. 
The interviewee had been shot and fatally wounded. You can see them place their flag on his chest. As he was carried away, the white flag was turning red. Carry him. They've killed him, yells this youth. Then suddenly, more gunfire. They scream at a child telling him to find cover. By this stage, the man's wife, his widow, has heard what happened. Oh. And as she rushes to the scene, she meets the party carrying away the body oh. on a makeshift stretcher. When they're satisfied they're a safe distance away, they stop. And the morning starts. These tragic scenes have been repeated time and time again since this war began. At one point they tried CPR, but there was no bringing him back, this husband and father. Yet another innocent... So there's about 30,000 civilians now dead in Gaza. 12,000 or maybe even now 13,000 children dead in Gaza. Six to 7,000 women and I need to revise something. I've been saying this is indiscriminate murder. That's actually not correct. It's not indiscriminate. It is discriminate murder. It's not like, hey, I don't know who I'm shooting and I'm just going to shoot in every which direction. It is, I am purposefully going to target even these civilians. Because they don't care. They're not viewed as civilians. The IDF does not view these people as civilians. They think there are no innocent people in Gaza. So they're all fair game. Even a guy waving a white flag. We remember that story from a couple weeks ago of it was Israeli hostages who were waving a white flag and they got killed. So it's like everything that moves, everything that moves, go for it. And by the way, let's also be clear that there's been a massive, massive slowdown in information coming out of Gaza. Why? Because a lot of the people who were gathering that information have been killed. They've been murdered. In some instances, definitely on purpose. There's over 100 journalists who've been killed. That is the worst number for any conflict ever in human history. They are purposefully targeting journalists. So, And that also makes me wonder about the capacity for various human rights organizations to continue to tell us what the death toll is, right? Like, even the Euromed monitor numbers have sort of stalled out a little bit in recent weeks, and that makes me think, is it actually because... It's stalling out a little bit, or is it just an information gathering problem? I don't know the answer to that, but I know what we've witnessed to this point, and it's the ugliest thing I've ever seen, certainly in my lifetime. As I told you guys before, you know, this isn't a defense of the U.S. military, but without a doubt, the way the IDF functions makes the U.S. military look like Noam Chomsky, you know, and that's taking into consideration everything in Iraq and Afghanistan and you know, the various uh, bombing campaigns that were disastrous with high civilian death rates. This far surpasses it in, in the size and the scope and the speed. It's, un it's absolutely unbelievable. It's incredible. All right, so now I'll just show you this real quick. U.S. strikes targets in Iraq after forces wounded. The United States carried out strikes in Iraq against three facilities linked to Iran-backed militia on Tuesday, the Pentagon said, after a weekend attack on an Iraqi air base that wounded U.S. forces. U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria have been attacked about now 150 times by Iran-aligned militants since the Israel-Gaza war started in October, creating pressure on Joe Biden to respond militarily despite political sensitivities in Baghdad. So let me pause there. I love how they, they frame that for you. It's creating pressure for Joe Biden to respond militarily. Oh, is it? Is it? Is that what's happening? See, I would argue quite the opposite. I'm of the Ronald Reagan school of thought on this. When uh, U.S. troops were attacked in Lebanon, what did he do? He cut and ran, as they said. He was like, I don't know what the fuck we're doing here. Let's get the fuck out. I think the same thing here. By the way, why are we in Iraq and Syria still? Certainly we know for Syria, Donald Trump said it. We're going to occupy about a third of the country, and that's the oil-rich portion of the country. And they give whatever other, you know, rationalizations and justifications about stability in the region. Does this look like it's adding stability? In fact, the Iraqi prime minister came out the other day and made the exact same point. He was like, look, if you were here for stability, uh, if it was leading to stability, okay. But now it's not leading to stability. It's leading to instability. 
and it really uh, fires up a whole bunch of conflicts that, you know, had sort of stabilized over time. Do we want another Sunni-Shia hot war in Iraq, which might be something that we're heading towards? You have all these Shia militias now attacking the U.S. and, the ba and various bases, both in Iraq and Syria. Most of these attacks didn't kill anybody. Most of these attacks, it was just some, like, minor property damage, but apparently one recently actually did, at the very least, injure some troops. Maybe it killed some U.S. troops. And then it's like, all right, well, all systems go, and we're going to start bombing everything in return. And it's like, well, the genesis of this whole thing is Israel doing a genocide in Gaza. We could just remove our troops and get Israel to stop doing the genocide in Gaza. But no, it's like, let's retaliate, let's fire back in every which direction. So you want to bomb Syria, you want to bomb uh, Iraq, now you're bombing... Yemen, not just the Houthis on the sea, but also in Yemen proper. Any other countries you want to add to the list? By the way, I saw earlier today, there was a... And I'm not kidding. The U.S. government phrased it like this. They said, uh, we did self-defense strikes in Somalia. Self-defense strikes in Somalia? That's halfway around the world. What do you mean self-defense strikes? Now, to be fair, they're going after Al-Shabaab militants who are literally like horrific jihadists. But at the same time, it's like... Are we just going to do 78 different wars, have no congressional approval or authorization, no debate over it, no discussion over this, no, like, getting to the root of what the actual problem is and why we are where we are? The answer is we're just going to keep bombing. And by the way, I have a devastatingly sad um, number for you in a little bit, a poll number on what the U.S. is doing. Oh, it, oh it's ugly. It's ugly. And I'm actually kind of surprised because usually the U.S. is, uh, usually the public is way more anti-war than the government is. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But let me show you this. Israeli settlers dug small graves the size of children in front of a school for a Palestinian Bedouin community in Jericho in the West Bank this morning as a threatening message to the community. So you can see there. So this is what we've been dealing with in the West Bank. And we've talked about this time and time again, that with the fighting happening in Gaza, that has led to a surge in illegal Israeli settlers in the West Bank being barbaric and aggressive. And we remember it was, who was, I think it was Ben Gavir who was passing out more uh, high-tech weaponry to the illegal settlers in the West Bank. And they nominally said this was after October 7th. They acted like, oh no, this is just for, for protection. That's all this is. This is just for defensive purposes. And then lo and behold, violence skyrockets in the West Bank because of the aggressive actions of the illegal settlers. What a surprise. So, you know, at the same time Gaza is being obliterated, you have more mission creep in the West Bank. And we all know what the goal here is, is to change the facts on the ground so that you create so many illegal settlements that are so deep in Palestinian territory that when the time comes to make any sort of a deal, say, oh, what do you want me to do? The facts on the ground, this area is 82% uh, Israelis. Sure, it's illegal. Sure, they're settlers. Sure, they're religious fanatics. But the facts on the ground are what they are, so now you guys got to concede more territory. That's We know what this is. It's mission creep. They want to resettle Gaza. Effectively, they want to take over all of the West Bank, too. There's no denying that. But now it's... This sort of stuff is happening more regularly because there's a green light since October 7th. And they frame it in, oh, we need to protect ourselves, even though there literally is no Hamas in the West Bank. Hamas doesn't control the West Bank. That's the Palestinian Authority. They're not there. All right, let's continue. Israel proposes two-month fighting pause in Gaza for release of all hostages. So right up front, I'll tell you, Hamas already rejected this. And I got to be honest, I think it makes sense, right? Because it's like, we're, we're going to pause the ethnic cleansing and genocide for two months if you release all the hostages. But then after that, we're just going to go right back to doing that. Why would you agree to that? Of course you wouldn't agree to that. All right. They say, Israel has given Hamas a proposal through Qatari and Egyptian mediators that include, includes up to two months of a pause in the fighting as part of a multi-phase deal that would include the release of all remaining hostages held in Gaza, two Israeli officials said. While the proposal doesn't include an agreement to end the fighting, it is the longest period of ceasefire that Israel has offered Hamas since the start of the war. More than 130 hostages are still being held in Gaza, Israeli officials say. Several dozen hostages either died on October 7th or in the week since then. I don't like this phrasing because the fact of the matter is a number of these hostages were killed in Israeli airstrikes. A number of them have been killed that way. President Biden's advisor, Brett McGurk, he's like apparently the worst of the worst according to the reporting with his horrible ideas, traveled to Egypt on Sunday and will continue to Qatar afterwards for talks aimed at making progress in the negotiations to secure the release of hostages held by Hamas. 
Qatari and Egyptian mediators have been trying for weeks to bridge the gaps between the parties in order to make progress towards a deal. U.S. officials told Axios that reaching such an agreement might be the only path that could lead to a ceasefire in Gaza. Two Israeli officials said the Israeli war cabinet approved 10 days ago the parameters of a new proposal for a hostage deal, which are different from aspects of deals rejected by Hamas and more forward-leaning than previous Israeli proposals. Israeli officials said they are waiting for a response from Hamas, but stressed they are cautiously optimistic about the ability to make progress in the coming days. According to the proposal, the deal would include the release of all remaining hostages who are alive and the return of the bodies of dead hostages in several phases. The first phase would see the release of all of women uh, will see the release of women, men over the age of 60 years old, and hostages who are in critical medical condition, the official said. The next phases would include the release of female soldiers, men over the age of 60 years old, who are not soldiers, Israeli male soldiers, and the bodies of hostages. So look, I'll, I'll just say this. When it comes to making some sort of a deal here, um, whatever the deal is should include the release of all the hostages being held by Hamas, but also all of the Palestinian hostages, the Palestinian political prisoners who are being held by Israel. Now, by the way, there are thousands of thousands of them. So totally in favor of a full swap. Release all the hostages here. Release all the hostages here. That's got to that's got to be on the table. And then beyond that, ending the fighting, ending the war, no temporary ceasefire. It, look, we've already seen the horrific atrocities day in and day out. So many hospitals bombed, schools, standalone UN buildings, marketplaces, factories, houses. North Gaza is wiped off the map. You know, it's South Gaza is in the process of being wiped off the map. We've seen that people are starving. There are hundreds of thousands starving in Gaza. People don't have water. It's still a medieval siege. We, we can't, like, first of all, this should just stop, period, right? Regardless of any sort of deal. But second of all, if you're going to make a deal... Of course, the fighting has to stop and you swap all the hostages. But unfortunately, the world we live in with the psychos uh, controlling it, it doesn't look like that's what's going to happen. So um, in this situation, Hamas already rejected this deal. I wonder if the talks have fallen apart completely or if there's still some conversations going on. But um, I mean, I, I would love to see movement in a proper direction. But we, as we all know, Israel holds all the cards because they've proven time and time again, we don't care about the hostages. They don't. It took the hostages' families storming the Knesset to get them to be like, all right, maybe we'll try to take it a little more seriously. But it's been very clear for quite a while that Netanyahu does not prioritize the hostages. Neither does Ben Gavir, neither does Smotrich, neither does a lot of these psychos. Um, maybe the opposition party cares a little bit, but, I mean, it is not their priority. All right, let me show you this. Tal Mitnick, the Israeli 18-year-old who was sentenced to 30 days in prison for refusing to enlist in the IDF, has reportedly just been resentenced to another 30 days. Sentences for conscientiously, object conscientiously objecting in the past have been up to 10 days. So, used to be 10 days, now they 60 days they want for this guy, and who knows if they'll continue it. Why? Because this, this was a high-profile thing. This was reported in The Intercept, by the way. This was a high-profile thing. This teenager, as a matter of conscience, said, I'm not going to go partake in a genocide and an ethnic cleansing. And they threw the book at him. Especially if you hype it up, especially if you go to the media, especially if you make a big deal out of it, especially if you show, like, this is immoral and I'm going to be moral. They're trying, uh, you know, to make an example of this guy. Unbelievable. This, this kid's a hero, as is anybody who is, you know, conscripted in the IDF and they tell them to go fuck themselves. All right, I got to show you this. This is quite a video. This is on Sky News. They're uh, debating the Houthi action. And I have to say, I love uh, every part of this. Watch. Dr. Francois, I mean, there are many who are saying that, frankly, the Biden administration should have acted sooner and faster, that hundreds of billions of dollars uh, has been put at risk because the Houthis have held uh, this area in the Red Sea um, at ransom. Sorry, so just let me get this straight, Yelda. So we are bombing the poorest, one of the poorest countries in the world that has been under a humanitarian blockade. There has been famine. These people have been decimated. And we are bombing them because a couple of guys in dinghies in support for the Palestinians who are having a genocide committed against them. They're objecting to that. And we're bombing them. Come on now. I mean, well, this it, is I, just an insane world for us to even think. I'm so sorry your Amazon packages are delayed. I really am. Like, I wish mine came on time. But, you know, genocide, guys, genocide. There are two mothers a day dying in Gaza right now. It's 109 days into a conflict in which a humanitarian crisis has been declared to the world day but by in, the way, day out. By the way, Dr. Fr God bless this woman, man. Because that, I mean, she's really speaking for exactly how I feel about the situation. Like, really? 
we're going to uh, get all outraged about uh, uh, an attempt to block some trade going into Israel. We're going to be really pissed off about that at the same time that babies are relentlessly being carpet bombed in Gaza. People are being starved to death. They have no clean water. They have no electricity. Every kind of civilian infrastructure imaginable is being bombed. I just don't, I don't, like, your moral compass has to be absolutely shattered and disgustingly broken to have that be your concern over what we're witnessing. It's literally saying, like, trade is more important than Palestinian children. Really? Trade is more important than human life? And again, look, when we had a ceasefire, when we had a temporary ceasefire, what happened? The Houthis were largely hands-off. Maybe there was a handful of things that, that happened, but they largely cut it out with their, their attempted blockade. As soon as the fighting started again, they kept doing it, and they said very clearly, they've been saying it time and time again, we'll stop. We'll stop when you stop bombing Gaza. Okay, this isn't fucking rocket science. They should stop bombing Gaza anyway. Never mind now with the extra incentive of like, hey, if you want trade to be free-flowing to Israel, well then, stop. All right. So now, this, this is what I was talking about before. 74% of Americans support attacking the Houthis. Do you support or oppose the retaliatory attacks by U.S. and, mul and a multinational coalition forces against Houthis? So right off the bat, let me just say this. That is biased, the way they framed it, without a doubt. Because they say, retaliatory attacks. Is there any mention that what the Houthis are doing is in retaliation to Israel doing a genocide in Gaza? Would they ever describe the Houthis' actions as retaliatory? Never. Even if it literally is. Never. They would never. By definition, U.S. enemies are offensive and aggressive. By definition, we are defensive and we are the bumbling do-gooder with the purest intentions in the world. Us and our allies. That's how this works. So I don't agree with the way they frame these. this. And also, the, the subtle trick to try to make you think, this is very legitimate, is the multinational coalition of forces against the Houthis. A multinational coalition is for it. It must be real. It must be good. This is the trick. This is what the trick Bush did for the war in Iraq. We have a coalition of the willing. Here's a bunch of nations that are on board with it. And that gives it this fake veneer of seriousness. Like, hey, it's not just us that agree. It's all these other people. It must be legit. They all agree. That's the trick. It's total garbage. I hate the way this is, this is phrased. Now, having said that, there's no denying the results, right? Because even if you ask the question maybe in a more direct way, I still think it'd be a bad result based on this. 74% support the bombing. Now, my guess is literally none of the people who are answering this actually are familiar with the facts on the ground. And if they were familiar with the facts on the ground, I think they changed their mind. But look, something has to be said about this notion. It's really not that difficult to get Americans to support a bombing campaign, now is it? Generally, when you look at polling, the people are way more anti-war than the government is, than the politicians are, than the Pentagon and the military industrial complex are. There's no denying that. But it is very wag the dog-ish, isn't it? To just, you just come up with the name of a group that sounds like, ooh, Houthis, oh, that sounds really bad. Houthis, oh yeah, I'm totally in favor of bombing them. It reminds me of, there was an old poll. Tell me if you guys remember this. There was an old poll where uh, Americans were asked if they support the bombing of, I think it was called Agrabah, which is like the name of the fictional city in Aladdin or some shit like that. Americans were asked, do you support the bombing of Agrabah? And the way they phrased it, it was like a majority that supported the bombing. And it was, it's like, what am I supposed to do with that? What am I supposed to do with that? If you are just coasting through life, still under the assumption that the paradigm of U.S. good, everybody else bad is legitimate, I don't know how to help you. I don't. I want you to be a little more intellectually curious. I want you to dig a little bit deeper. I want you to be a little more familiar with the facts on the ground and the histories and the reality of what's happening. Because 74%, I don't care how biased the question is, 74% is fucking pathetic. It's pathetic. That means you just come up with any name that sounds sort of vaguely foreign and, and say, multinational coalition, retaliatory strikes. And people be like, yeah. Because literally, if you see retaliatory, then you're in your mind you go, oh, so it's a retaliation to somebody else that did something aggressive, so I support it. And it's like, bullshit way to frame the question, but also totally untrue. And maybe people should be a little more intellectually curious and dig into like what's actually going on here. So, pathetic poll result. Result. No spinning it whatsoever. Um, literally every demographic supported the bombing. The way they phrase the question is total garbage. But at the same time, I fear that even if you ask the question in a more direct way, people still be like, yeah, you know, bad guys do bad things. We're the good guys. We do good things. So we're going to bomb the bad guys, right? 
Uh, I mean, very straightforward, right? Jesus Christ. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop. And watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.